Welcome to Haunting Live Podcast this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you so much for subscribing to our YouTube channel as well. We are live every Sunday on YouTube at 4 o'clock with a new guest. Uh, This week we do have a very special guest. We're going to get into a different topic we have not had really on the show before and get a little bit creepy in here. And we're going to talk about cryptids, which is a big part of the paranormal field. And um, sometimes it's just not talked about that much. But today we do have a very special guest coming all the way from USA. Robin is joining us and she has a lot of interest in the topic and knowledge on different cryptids. So we're going to bring her in. So let's talk to Robin today. Hi Robin, how are you? I'm good. How how are you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for being here on uh, episode number 40 of season 2. I appreciate you taking your time and talking to us today about some cryptid talk. Well, I appreciate you having me. Oh, that's wonderful. So um, let's start at the beginning there. Um, what drew you into the cryptid topic? Was it an experience that you had or something, or did you have an interest in the topic? Well, for me, it's a little bit different. I It wasn't that I developed an interest. I just never really knew that they weren't there. I was a toddler when the first one came near me, and I was out playing, and there was three or four of them that were standing in the tree line. And they would watch me play. And I just honestly didn't realize that it was not the normal. And so as I learned to talk, you know, your cryptids mind speak. And I know there's a lot of controversy on that, but they actually do. And so they were mind speaking with me really, even before I could talk. I grew up not realizing that not everybody did that. And I didn't really realize for quite a while that not everybody was able to have these things around me. By the time I was four, I had had my first um, ET abduction. And so all of these things just kind of happened to me. I never went out in search of Bigfoot or the dogmen or the cat people or elementals, dimensionals, you name it. They found me. So they were kind of my own introduction to it. And they were just part of my life. I never really thought anything about it. I never thought that it was different or anything. You know, I asked my mom and dad and I said, you know, what, this was before the Patterson Gimlin uh, footage came out. I was born in 64. And so it hadn't come out yet. And I said to my mom and dad, I'm asking them questions about stick structures and I'm telling them about stick structures and about the UFOs and the ETs and the Bigfoot and the Dogmen. And I was very blessed. My parents were never negative about it. They just said, you know, that that was something they didn't know about, that they couldn't help me with it. You know, but they were never mean or nasty about it. They just said, we're sorry, we don't know anything about that. You know, maybe it was in a dream or or whatever. Not in a dream. And when I got older, my mom said that I used to talk about an imaginary friend that followed me all around that was taller than my dad and covered in hair. And she said, you know, one had a tail, one didn't have a tail, you know, and it was just, that was my life. I I just don't know any different. Right. So were these um, more physical to you then? Were they like something you would see all the time or was it something more, um, in your mind that in your mind's eye that you would sense or how, how would they appear to you? Um, when they were around and they weren't around 24 hours a day by any means, but when they were around, they were physical. You know, I would hear them talk to me in my head and once in a while, you know, the Bigfoot would talk verbally when I was outside playing, they'd call my name or something. But, um, yeah, I mean, I saw them physically. 
And as I got older, and I realized that not everybody had these shared experiences, I just went quiet about it. You know, every time I went by the woods, I was looking in the woods in case I would see one or if I would see stick structures. And I always, I was drawn to the woods, always have been. And I would go out, I grew, was born and raised in Michigan. And so I was out in the woods as much as I possibly could. And the first thing I would do is look for footprints and I'd look for structures. And I mean, I was a young kid. I, nobody was ever talking about it. I just automatically did it because I just didn't know there was anything else. It was just my crazy life. Well, it's a great way to spend your childhood anyways, going through the bush and exploring as well. So I'm sure you explored a lot. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things that you found once you started looking around? Um, footprints, I would find, you know, hair that was unexplained and um, a ton of structures. And I would ask them, you know, what some of the structures, not all of them, but I would ask them certain ones and they would tell me and I would just talk to them. They were just like my friends. I, I just didn't really realize that there was all this hoopla about them because I never knew any different, you know, and as I got older and I was in my twenties and by then I was married and I had started a family and wherever I moved, they would turn up. And then it started where other people would see them that were around me. You know, when I was younger, it was different because, you know, I just didn't talk to people about them because nobody else seemed to know anything about them. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know. I don't want people to think I'm, you know, making something up or doing anything. So I just stayed quiet. I loved it when they were around. You know, there were times I would be at home and I'd see one peek in a window and I never panicked. I knew what they were and I just kept my mouth shut. And you know, I don't really know why I didn't talk about it more. My parents, like I said, were fantastic to me about it. I never felt like they downplayed it or blew me off. They just didn't know what to say to me. And the abduction, the first one that I remember, I was four. And I, I don't know if it was something that was done to me. It was not a traumatic experience. I remember everything that went on. I remember everything in the room. I remember the, you know, the ETs that were there. I just, for whatever reason, until I was probably in my twenties, I never spoke about it. I remembered it. I remembered it all the time and the memory never changed. I just didn't talk about it. And then when I got in my twenties and we were living in this one house and I had my children and they would come up to the house all the time. I mean, they literally did. I came home one day and wanted actually that was the only time they've ever done damage in major damage in the house. And they had wanted, I, I think it was only one had come in my sliding door and I had a bag of dog food outside that hadn't been open. And that thing looked like somebody took a machete to it. There was not one kibble left out of the dog food bag and the door was partly open. And I went in and the whole house was just turned upside down. I found the dogs hiding in the closet. And I mean, they've gotten in the house before, but they've never been overly bad. I mean, the worst they've ever done besides that was, you know, they got in my pantry like, I don't know, six, seven months ago, you know, and they got some stuff all over. But for the most part, I don't ever, I don't have problems with them. You know, I've been called out to areas to help people that have had aggressive ones. And I've done that to various places, but the ones that I normally you know, have around, I don't have problems with them. I don't have problems with the dog men either. You know, again, I've helped in situations where there were aggressive ones, but the ones that stick around me have been good. But there's multiple of people that have seen them around me. That was the thing. You know, you can sit there and downplay it and say, well, maybe you're crazy, but how are you crazy when the rest of your life is normal? And then how do you think you're crazy when you're sitting there and other people watch what's happening? And they see the same thing that you're seeing. And of course, I, yeah, I have pictures like, every, you know, but um, yeah, it's just always been a part of my life. I got more open about it in my 20s. But at that time, I didn't know, you know, Facebook wasn't around and um, there wasn't really any place to go to talk to anybody. I did speak to somebody at Michigan Bigfoot, who is probably one of the dearest people I've ever met in my life still a friend of mine. His name is Bob Daigle. He helped me more than anybody just because he listened. 
And I'm like, all these things are going on and all these incredible things are going on, you know, and I just needed to download. And I get a lot of people that contact me now that need that as well. So what do you think happened to you personally first and were you contacted by Sasquatch or Dogman first or were you abducted by ET first? Um, I wish I had a clear memory on that. I think the Sasquatch were first, followed by the dogmen. The ETs, when they took me when I was four, they had said that they had taken me before that. And I'm not going to say they didn't. I don't know. I have no memory of it if they did. So, you know, I don't have any memory of that. I just remember when I was four. Yeah, it's uh, weird. Sometimes I've heard of cases where ETs just wipe the memory out so you don't know what happened before, but maybe at that point they felt that you were ready for their knowledge or something. So, Well, they've taken me on and off throughout my life, and I've had different experiences where there's missing time. I was speaking with a fellow researcher, and I was living at this one place in Michigan, and we had so much activity with the Sasquatch. It was unbelievable. I mean, they were, I went outside with them every single night, every night I was out there sitting on a log and they were walking around me or I was standing up by my house and they would be in the the tree line. And there were people that would come to my house and see the same thing. It wasn't just me, but I was very selective about who I would let come to my home because they were there all the time. And you know, they do have the ability to cloak. If you ask them how they do it, they'll tell you they bend light. And they were very comfortable there. They would walk uncloaked around my property all the time. It, it was just a normal thing. And he had been out there and I was talking to a researcher and it was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I saw a ship come down on the side of my yard because I was out in the woods. The house was out in the woods and I saw it come down. It came about 20 feet off the ground. And when it did, I have no memory for an hour and 45 minutes. I saw it there. And then next thing I knew I was standing there again, I'm looking at the phone and I could see where the phone had hung up. And I was so dazed and confused. And I was like, I didn't know what was going on. It was like in my brain, my brain was talking to me and I was talking to myself, but my body was non-responsive, completely non-responsive. And I looked at the phone and it was an hour and 45 minutes later. And I knew what time it was when I saw it because I had the foresight of looking at the phone when I saw it because I thought, oh God, here we go again. And I looked at the phone and I saw the time and then I don't have any memory of anything. And when I looked at it again, it's the clock on my phone was an hour and 45 minutes later. So I looked at it. I saw that I had been talking to somebody. I called that number back and the person I was talking to said, hey, where'd you go? I just thought maybe your battery died on your phone because it just went completely static and you were gone. And I said, "I, I don't know what happened. Like I really couldn't verbalize what had just transpired. I couldn't even say it to him. So I got off the phone. I went in the house completely stoic. Like I felt like I was a robot. I mean, I went in there. I said to my kids, did everybody do their homework? Got snacks, got showers. Yeah, mom. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to go to bed, which I always went to bed after them. And they were, they were preteen and teenagers. So, you know, they were capable of going in and going to bed. I went in and I went to bed for three days. I barely spoke to anybody. I barely ate. I really don't remember much of that three days, but the whole time in my mind, it was like, I was talking to myself going, Oh my God, what happened? You know, what happened and why am I not reacting? But my body and I, it would not react. And I barely even spoke to my family. And on the third day I took the kids to school. I came home. I went up the steps, the same steps that I'd went in after this had happened. And I had a massive panic attack. I could not catch my breath. And it was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what just happened to me? I mean, it was just really traumatic, but I don't have any memory of what was done. And then I ran in the house and I'm like, now there's nobody here to tell what happened. 
you know, by the time the kids got home, I was calm and I didn't want to say that anything to them because I didn't want them to be fearful. You know, they already were growing up with Bigfoots all around and peeking in the windows. You know, I mean, it's like they've seen the dogmen, they've seen the Bigfoot, they've seen the UFOs. And, you know, I, my one son is, has seen an ET because it showed up at the end of his bed. But, you know, I mean, it, they, they grew up with the Bigfoot. They're, they're used to them at this point. You know, and my grandkids have, when they were at my house, my five-year-old granddaughter was staying with me while her mom was in boot camp and her five-month-old brother. And she was outside playing and we had the front yard was grass, but it was all sand as well. And she was out there digging in the sand and I was making her lunch and I looked out the kitchen window and I would see this pebble roll from the woods out to where she was at. And she would laugh and she'd pick it up and she'd toss it back in the woods. Pretty soon it'd come in and roll back out again. And this went on for a couple of minutes. And I thought, oh, God, the guys are here, you know, because I have certain ones that I'm very close to. And I'm thinking, I hope it's them and not a bad one. And I went out. And as I went out, she stood up and I had just taken her to see Elvin and the Chipmunks at the movies. And she said, Grandma, Grandma, you have Elvin and the Chipmunks at your house, but yours are really, really tall. <laughs> I was like, yeah, they are. That's awesome. At least they're trying to... Um... I guess, sort of make friends with your child, with your children yeah. as well, not one, being harmful or something yeah. to them. Yeah, the, the clan that I had at that particular house, where I'm at now, I've got like three or four clans that come in and they've been really good. I've not had any experience where I've been fearful of them. They don't come as, I mean, they come up and they look in the window and they're climbing on the roof and, the, you know, their handprints are all over my car and, you know, they leave me stuff on my porch and I've got a picture of one sitting on my porch that the security camera picked up. But the ones that were at that particular home in Michigan, it was altogether different. I mean, it was astronomical. I had one that walked up and stood 10 feet from me in full physical form. And my son was coming through the field. And there was one, they do a belly crawl. And it, it's really a lot like what Scooby-Doo does. You know, how he gets on his fingers and his toes and he goes, da, 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 da. well, the, the Bigfoots do it. And they can do it very quickly. And it's not uncommon for them to go and pull somebody's legs out from under them so you land on your butt. They've not done that to me, but I've spoken to a lot of people that they have done that to. And it was on the ground and it was going across where my son was going to walk and I how and then there was another female that was over off to my left in the woods with her baby and I didn't want my son scared and the one was standing 10 feet from me his name is Shadow he's very very dear to me and I hollered to my son and I said you've got one on the ground in front of you you need to stop let it get past and then you've got one over to my left and I want you to just walk straight towards me and he said, okay, mom, I will. Well, when I hollered to tell him that, because my first priority is my child. And when I hollered to him, it scared Shadow. And I was he was standing 10 feet from me and he instantly cloaked. And at that point, you know, everybody was talking about, do they cloak? Do they not cloak? I had known for years that they were doing it. But when the big controversy of cloak or do they not, do they do it? Do they don't, you know? I was like, well, maybe I'm wrong, you know, and I was like questioning what I already knew was true. And so he's standing 10 foot from me and he cloaked and I'm like, okay, well now that settles that. <laughs> now we know. Well, I, ha I have heard many reports and stuff when I listen to different shows of them doing that. And people have said, just like you had, they've been right in front of them and disappeared. So, I mean, like, there's no evidence right there. It's just, it just happened right in front of you. So, yeah, I would go for a walk in the woods and I walked out there every, I was out there multiple times a day with them. And in the fall and in the winter, I would be walking down the path. Um, we had 10 acres at the time and there would be footsteps going right next to me. And I would watch it depress down into the leaves. And when there was snow, I would see footprints being made right next to me. You know, and it, it's like, how do you dispute that? But I did ask them how they did it. My husband um, and I 
he now works with me in this craziness. Um, after a while, and this is probably, I don't know, I guess I've always done it, but I'm more so in the last 10, 15 years. Um, I, do, I basically, it's not really work for them, but I do things for them as they need it. Um, my condition is as long as it's not anything that's going to hurt any of our people or hurt their people, then I'm in. And my husband, I had gotten divorced and I remarried and I met him because he was experiencing things that he couldn't understand or explain. And he didn't, you know, he's like, am I nuts or what's going on? And he might speak. He's one of the best I've worked with. There's only one other person that I think that is as good as he is. And fortunately I work with both of them. So um, it's phenomenal. And so it works really well for us because I can bounce all this stuff back and forth and he experiences it as well as I do. So it, it makes it easier, but we both asked them, you know, how do you do the cloaking? Because that was like the million dollar question. Everybody wanted to know. And they just laugh. They've got a very wicked sense of humor. They're warped and they just, well, we just bend light. We don't go anywhere. Now, if they want to leave, they can, and you can't see them, but there's two types of cloaking. There is a shimmer which looks like the predator, like that gelled water look. And that's, that's more called a shimmer. And then you have the actual cloaking. And with the actual cloaking, they go 100% transparent. So have they told you then what causes them to cloak? Like, is there certain times that they have to cloak or that they feel they need to cloak? Is there a certain reason why they do it? Yeah, I mean, all of... All of them are born with paranormal abilities, an extreme amount of paranormal abilities. Now, they don't all use them. It depends on the clan and what the laws of the clan are. If their parents don't let them know that they can do these things, they don't know they can do them. It's just like, and I tell this to people a lot, if you compare it to the Amish, Amish different sectors allow certain things. Some will allow electricity, some won't. You know, some won't use a vehicle. They'll only use the horse and buggy. So it really depends on how they're raised. And so the ones, if and there has been a number of evidence where ones that did not know they had paranormal abilities when they moved away from that clan as they got older and went somewhere else and that clan did use abilities and they, got, they started using theirs. Now, as far as why do they do it, there's a number of reasons. They do it if they don't want you to find them. They do it if they're hiding from somebody. They do it if they're pulling pranks. They do it if they are what they call counting coup. And with counting coup, it at some point in time, it, it used to be where it was for a ritual as a rite of passage. But now they do it just because they think it's funny. And what they do is they go completely cloaked where you can't see them at all. And the whole name of the game is to walk up to a human and touch them with their hand to see if they can do it and not get caught. And they think it's hysterical. They they have done that to me more times than I can count. Yeah, I wonder if that's the same sort of phenomena where people have them cross in front of their cars when driving. Because a lot of people have that. They'll report them running across in front of the car, but they'll say, well, there's no cars behind me. There's no cars in front of me. But yet it chose that moment to go right in front of my vehicle. I almost hit it kind of thing. So is that sort of like a game thing they do as well? Um, that I've not heard of them doing as a game. Do I think that they would do that as a game? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, some of these adolescents, I, you know, they, I, I also worked on the DNA study with Dr. Melba Ketchum and she tested some of the samples that I turned in and they really and truly are a human hybrid. And before I ever met her, they had already told me what they were because I simply asked them. So you have to understand that they are a human. They're an ancient human, but they're not like us. Okay. They have their own culture, their own way of, they have their own language. They have their own alphabet. They can write, you know, they can read basic things. So they truly are a human in every sense of the word, but their ways are not ours. Our words do not mean what it means to them. And you get a lot of miscommunication there, but they do have a wicked sense of humor. They absolutely do. Igor Borsov was at my house one day, and I've talked about this in other podcasts, where we had decided we had a feeding area, 
And I used to have it at the back of the woods. And I thought, why am I lugging this stuff back to feed them every night when they're coming up and knocking on my walls all night long? I might as well just feed them up by the house. So I did, which I don't recommend to people, but I was. And we had taken a jar of chicken leg in it and it had the jar had a screw top on it. And it was out in the feeding area. And he stayed outside all night long in a pickup truck and he watched it so that he could watch them come in and unscrew the top and he was going to photograph it and everything. He stayed there all night long and they never came in. And about 530 in the morning, he wanted a cup of coffee and to use the restroom. So he gets out of the truck, he comes in the house and he does his thing. He goes back out and the jar is empty and sitting on the truck, <laughs> sitting on the hood of the truck, you know, and they're laughing, you know, they, they really are. They had me, you know, your exes, when they build the stick structures, the upright exes means stay out. If you've got the two poles, one pole on each side and an X in the middle, that's a territorial marker and a stay out. But when they do ground exes, small ground exes mean welcome. And at the time, I was living in a double wide and it had the skirting around the bottom. And they, the adolescents had pulled the skirting underneath my window. They had ripped it off completely and they would go under there. And at night they would knock on the floor. I would get out of bed. I'd knock back on the floor and then they would move to another part of the house and knock again. And I'd follow them around and I'd knock back and it was a game. Well, then they started tearing apart the skirting at the end of the house. And it was terrible because Michigan winters are brutal. You can't have all that cold air under there. It freezes your pipes. So I kept trying to close it off and they kept opening it. And I thought I have begged and pleaded. They still keep doing it. I'm going to use their own way of speaking and I'm going to do a ground X because I didn't realize that the ground X meant welcome. I put the ground X on the ground outside of it. And I thought, surely this will make them stop because they're going to see in their own way. This means stay out. I get up the next morning and there's hardly anything left of the skirting. And I'm absolutely livid. And the one that I'm closest to is cracking up. He is laughing his butt off. And I said, what is so funny? I'm mad. And he said, you're a silly human. He said, the ground X means welcome. You just invited them all under the house. <laughs> I was like, good Lord. Well, hopefully that was a lesson for you to learn as well, not to do the welcome X. <laughs> yeah, we didn't do the welcome X anymore there. That was just too much. I had put, they love to look in my be, uh, my bedroom window at night. And when I had my bed where it was up against the window or near the window, I always had my window open and I didn't have a screen on that window and they would reach their hand in and they play with my hair at night. And it was like, I was asleep, but I knew what they were doing. And I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have mud and leaves and everything in my hair, you know, and the windowsill was all covered in mud. So. I moved the bed and it was hot. It was summertime. And I put a window air conditioner in that window. And I don't know what they did that I didn't hear it, but I got up the next morning and that when the air conditioner was out of the window and out in the woods, I mean, they were not having that at all. And they, I mean, they would sit under that window and they'd talk and they'd chatter all night long, but they got to where they wanted me outside. And at two o'clock in the morning, every single night, they would knock on the walls. And I, you know, I, like I said, I don't recommend doing the things that I did to anybody because I didn't have anybody to go to talk to. I was on my own with all of it. And I always had been. And I would go outside in my pajamas and my slippers, no flashlight, no weapon, no nothing. And I'd go out there and I'd sit and they'd walk around and they'd talk and I'd see them. And, you know, I mean, this was a nightly thing. Okay, let's switch topics a little bit then. Um, those are your sort of uh, Sasquatch Bigfoot that you have on your property. You mentioned as well that you know about Dogman and since you previously yes. you lived in Michigan, I know Michigan is a hot spot for Dogman. Um can you tell us a little bit about what the dog man is uh, for people that don't know? Sure. Dog man has the head of a dog. Some people say it looks more like a wolf because some of them have a lot more hair. There's no two Bigfoot or dog men alike. Okay. They're all individualized just like we are. And they have the body of a man. They're extremely tall. Um, if you ask them what they are, which is what I did, just like I did with the Bigfoot. 
they said they were canine, human, and star people. And that came out of their, you know, they will mind speak. And when they mind speak, you can understand them very well. When you try to get them to actually speak, speak like the Bigfoot will speak words. Dogmen are not like that. They, I've seen a couple of them try. It just doesn't really work well. But if, when they mind speak, they're fluent. And I've always had them around me. I, I had them at the Michigan property. I, all three places I lived at Michigan, one, five places I've lived at in Michigan my whole life. And they were always around. Um, I have them here. I've not had problems with them. And they, you know, there's more than one kind of argument. I see people that put them in anywhere from six to eight different, what they call variants. And, you know, everybody's in my opinion and I fully respect that. I would never discredit anybody's views. I don't share the same views. Basically, you know, they're just dogmen. The only thing that I find the differences are in is the ones that the ETs created and the ones the government created. Because the ones the government created are made to kill. That's what they're there for. The other ones that the ETs created, they're more like the police of the woods. But I think it's really important that people understand that with all of these, There is good and bad in every bit of it, okay? We have good and bad in our people. So by no means should anybody think that they're all good or they're all bad. Because what happens is the bad ones are lethal, but the good ones seem to have a deeper sense of love than we comprehend at all, much deeper than what our type of humans encounter. So what was your type of experiences that you have had with them then since you've encountered, have you encountered both kinds or? Um, I've talked with the ones that were that bad. And I've also talked with the nasty ones that have gone after different people and kind of like intervened a little bit there. But the ones that have been around me have always been very peaceful, very helpful. Um, I have not had any issue with them. My one son actually was out on our property and a baby dogman pup approached him. He had gone out extremely early. He was sitting at the base of a big tree and he had fallen asleep and he woke up and it was standing there staring at him and its head back and forth and kind of making some whimpering noises until mom howled and turned around and ran back to mom. And so my son got out of there thinking it was probably not best to stick around, but I've not had any aggressive ones bother me. I, like I said, I've talked to them. um, And, you know, realize just how dangerous they can be. Not only the military ones, but the bad ones, you know, that were, are the normal ones. And I, I'm not going to tell anybody that they're not dangerous because, but it's not because they're a dogman. It's anything. I mean, with our people, we have psychopaths, we have murderers, we have rapists, we have pedophiles. It is not any different with any of these things. So, and, you know, nothing is going to, is altogether bad. Nothing is altogether good. But I personally, the ones that have stayed around me throughout my lifetime, I've had no issues with. I have dealt with other ones that are bad that were off my property that were bothering other people. And I've talked to them, but the ones that stay around me have been good. That's good. At least you're attracting the more positive side of things with the cryptids. Um, what sort of experiences have you had at your house that you can talk about where you are now? So you had things in Michigan where I know there's a lot of cryptid activity there. Um, what sort of cryptid activity do you currently have at your house where you live now? Um, it's it's pretty active. <laughs> I've had a lot of people that I've had come here and they just kind of shake their heads and go, I couldn't do this. I couldn't live like this. But, you know, the thing is, is I, I've told them all, you know, they're welcome to be here as long as they come in peace. If they're here for anything else, then they will be dealt with. But we get them looking in the window. Um, I had a dog man pup that wanted me to come out. They like my energy and they're always wanting me to come out so they can look at me and feel my energy. And I'm like, OK, um, everything is based on energy with all these things, energy and vibration. That's the key to all of them. And I do energy work, which I didn't know I could do. Um, They taught me how to do it. And so 
he had come to the house and he wanted me to come out so that he could see me and feel my energy. And I said, well, it was 830 at night, which isn't really late, but I had been busy all day long and I was just tired. I was laying on the bed watching TV and I said, no, I don't really want to come out. And he said, well, you can come out and take my picture. And I said, now I know you're lying because you guys don't want your picture taken. The Bigfoot believe, and I think the dogmen probably do to a certain extent, the camera steals your soul. And that's a Native American traditional thing. And so that's the whole thing. There's, there's more reasons as to why they're always blurry, but you know, they don't want it taken for that reason. So anyways, like you can take my picture. And I said, no, you're lying because you guys don't like your picture taken. And he said, oh, I promise I'll let you take my picture. So I said, all right. So I went outside and I stood there and I said, no, I'm going to take a picture. And if you're not in the picture, don't talk to me anymore. Cause I'm not going to talk to you if you're being deceitful and you're lying. Took the picture and there he was. So what actually was in the picture then? Can you describe it for the listeners to what you got? Sure. Um, it, the picture was that I took was like 20, 30 feet up a pine tree. We have very, very tall pine trees here. And he was just up sitting up in the, time, the pine tree. What I got was the face and his shoulders of a dog man pup. And I've had people look at, look at it and say, oh, it looks like a bear. No, it doesn't look like a bear. A bear does not have pointy ears. It does not have the canine snout. You know, I mean, it is what it is. And I don't try to make people believe anything. I don't try to convince people. Um, my thing is, I'm happy to share my experiences. I'm happy to share what I know. But I would never tell anybody what to think or believe. I think everybody accepts the truth in their own time. And, you know, people that are ready for it do and people that aren't, they will. But when I get, you know, the people that are like, oh, no, she's crazy. Or That's fine. You can believe that because you're going to go home and do go on with your life. But I'm going to go home and I'm going to play with the Bigfoot and I'm going to play with the dog men. So I'm fine with it. Yeah. And it's all about acceptance, too, and what you believe. That's the whole thing about with cryptids and anything it paranormal, is. really. Right. Like you have to put your own exactly. intuition and your own belief into what you believe so absolutely and i don't and i tell people this a lot i don't believe there are experts that is my own personal belief i know several people in this field of research that do not believe in that i don't believe there are experts because what we know we can is really not even a drop in the bucket of the truth of what's out there and I may have a lifetime of experiences, but I don't feel my experiences are more important than per se somebody that had one sighting because it all comes together. It's all part of the puzzle and we all kind of work together and learn from each other. So I just don't believe, you know, I have people come up to me and say, well, you know, all this about this and this, you're an expert. No, I'm not. Please don't call me an expert because I'm really not. I'm somebody that has led a very different life than most people have, but I don't consider my experiences any more important or significant than anybody else's. Yeah, we're the same way here too with the paranormal field, not just cryptids, but in the field as well. Um, if you label yourself an expert, then I tend not to believe most of what you say because there's no exactly. way you can know everything about the field. And you can't, if you're labeled, that's work. not really good to do, right? So to just be open I, and be open-minded about learning new things and that's all you can do. So Exactly. And the, the Sasquatch, they live their lives under the law of raw, which is the law of one. Everything that they believe is done as a collective. There, I mean, we really, there's so much that we can learn from them because in our culture, everybody's out for themselves. I mean, we have certain individuals that aren't obviously because they're a good person and, you know, they want to make a difference, but the, the majority is out for themselves. And that's not how these cryptids work. They look at it as a collective. They look at it that they all come together. Now you have clans that fight over territories or whatever, but the overall census of it is you work as a collective. And that would work so much better for, I think, the human human race as well, if we all work together more rather Absolutely. than being divided, even 
like we just had our elections here and like there was no point in having an election i don't think personally but um it's a time right now where we all need to be together more not saying okay let's call an election and divide it up more it just oh i agree 110 percent. i keep telling everybody like which party are you for and i'm like i'm not for either one of them they both behave badly i think we need to dismantle the government and rebuild <laughs> Oh, yes, I know. I've been sort of following the U.S. stuff lately as well. So, um, well, thank you very much, Robin, for being here today. I appreciate your insight into this topic that we rarely have here on Haunting Live. So it was great to get your insight and especially hear your personal stories as well. I think those are really interesting to people. And I think they'll uh, learn a lot from listening to your stories also. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. It was wonderful having you, and um, good luck on your property. I hope things don't change. I hope that you still have a great connection with the cryptids there, and um, yeah. you continue to work on that relationship there. Yeah, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. It's been every place I've ever lived, mm. and we are, as of right now, um, we're going into winter in Michigan, and mm. so we'll stay in South Carolina for the winter, but then we're heading home. And they'll, they'll just follow. They follow when I did before, you know, I mean, the paranormal side of them is so extensive. It's certainly not a problem for them to do it. And I didn't have the whole plan move here, but my top guys certainly did and brought their families. And so we've been here in South Carolina for three years. We've had just a huge amount of activity as well, but it's time to go home. So we're going to go home and go back out in the woods there and, and, you know, continue on it like I said I'm not concerned if it will happen there it's gone on my entire life it's never changed no matter where I lived so I don't expect it to change anytime soon <laughs> no definitely not you sound like you have a great uh, relationship with them anyway so but thank you again um, we appreciate you coming on today and talking to us about your experiences so thank you so much thank you